It is an honor to be here in Chula Vista. It is an honor to be in this extraordinary building. Um, I did not expect this building. The only time I've been to Chula Vista was to, be, to go to the Border Patrol Station. Did not look like this. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of pictures on the wall of people who looked like me. Uh, <laughs> but there was nothing like this. And um, to see this building is to just feel this flood of emotion about what libraries are, or maybe I should say, what libraries can be. That will be my subject tonight. I'm going to talk about what a library did to Richard Rodriguez growing up in Sacramento, California in the 1950s. Not a very interesting topic, but I, was, I, I would venture to say an oddly pertinent topic for San Diego to consider in 1999. There are lots of people who, um, when they introduce me, will tell you who it is that I am. I would like to tell you who it is that I am not. I realize this is a public building, and I am careful about not engaging in more political discussion than perhaps we need to. But one of the things I need to tell you tonight is that the man standing here at this microphone does not think that he is a minority in the way that the government defines that term. The government defines that term largely on numerical basis. It has established that there are certain groups of Americans who, as the government would argue, are underrepresented in our public life. And Hispanics as one of those groups means that Richard Rodriguez is a minority in a numerical sense. One of the things I am here tonight to tell you is that I am, not a num I am not a minority in a cultural sense precisely because of buildings like this. I used to be a minority. I meet them all the time. I meet them in prison. I meet them on street corners and gangs. I meet them in Idaho, skinheads in Idaho who want nothing to do with you white, black, brown. You want to meet a minority, I can introduce you to a few. But if you have come here tonight to listen to a minority, you have, you have misspent your time. I am not a minority in a cultural sense. And if you think I am, if you think that this middle class man with this American voice is a minority, then we all have problems because we don't know how to identify the kids in this country who really are in trouble. I am a Mexican American. I was born in the 16th century from the collision of Spain and the Indian. My mother was a hairless Indian. My father was a hairy Spaniard. He's under the impression that he raped her She's under the impression that she, deduced, she seduced him. <laughs> After four centuries, we still don't know. I'm a mestizo. By the 18th century in Mexico, the majority population already in Mexico by the 18th century, at a time when the, when the pilgrim and the Indian were peering at each other in the 13 original colonies, by the 18th century in Mexico, the majority population of Mexico was mixed, like me. The African slave comes to Mexico, and the African slave marries into the Indian population so rapidly that the Europeans scratch their head. They can't figure out why. Remember that fact. Jose Vasconcelos, the great Mexican philosopher, talks about the Mexican as being la raza cosmica, the cosmic race. Because within the Mexican is the world, he argues. Within the Mexican is the Indian, and the European, and the African, somos negros, and the Asian, somos chinos. That is who I am. And now I live in the United States of America. My disadvantage, if I could put it that way, was that I grew up working class, 
My parents had little formal education. They came to this country. My father was two years of Mexican grammar school education. My mother was only slightly more. They were people of extraordinary brilliance, the way people all over the world are brilliant at surviving. But did they know these books? No. Have they ever been in a library? No. In that sense, I was a minority. And when I first went to a classroom, I knew maybe 50 or 60 English words. My only advantage at that point was that I was educated, I was about to be educated by Irish Catholic nuns. And for any of you who know anything about Irish Catholicism or Irish Catholic nuns, you will know one thing, and that is that there is no sentimentality when it comes to education among the Irish. And they took a look at Richard Rodriguez coming through that door, shy, timid, afraid, the minority, culturally, who didn't want anything to do with los otros, los gringos, the kid who wanted to sit by himself, be by himself. Well, those Irish women came 6,000 miles to California, and they were not about to let me out of their hands. They picked on me. That one with the mustache, she was picking on me all the time. <laughs> Stand up. Say your name in a loud and clear voice so all the boys and girls can hear you. Well, I didn't want all the boys and girls to hear me. Why would I want to use language that way, publicly? Get your hands out of your pockets, Richard. Look up at me. Why don't you look up when you speak? Two months, four months, five months, they badgered and badgered and badgered. They picked on the minority. They wouldn't let me be. I wanted to go home. I wanted to be alone. And they said that I had some obligation to all the boys and girls in this room. I should use my voice in this loud voice and speak publicly. Why? I was a minority. I belonged elsewhere. I belonged with my own family. I belonged behind a door. And the Irish chased me, they chased me home. They came into the house one day, three nuns looking like three furies from a Greek tragedy. They sat on the blue sofa. They said to my mother, why don't you speak more English in the home to your son? And my mother said, yes, good idea. And at first it was a kind of game. We started, we would sit around at this time of the night. After dinner, we would conjugate English verbs and we would put Spanish endings on them. Tocamos. One day, one day the game came to an end. One day I walked into the kitchen when my mother and father were speaking Spanish to one another. I did not realize that they were speaking Spanish to one another until I walked into the kitchen and the moment that they saw me, they started speaking English, albeit broken. That day, the bird was pushed out of the nest. The story comes to an end. Richard Rodriguez goes to the sink, turns on the faucets, wanting to say something, wanting to scream, wanting to yell, wanting to cry, wanting to object. He turns on the faucet and feels dumbly the water coming onto his hands, the water cool, turning tepid, turning warm, turning hot, turning scalding, wanting to cry and not saying a word. And then I turned off the faucets and I walked out of the room. That day, I must have been seven years old, that day I was a long way from being a minority because I walked into the classroom and I was willing to have Ireland have its will. I was willing to speak in a loud and clear voice so all the boys and girls can hear me. This voice that I am using now is Ireland's voice. When people praise me right now for my genius, for my talent, for my skill with language, they are saying nothing. They are speaking about a group of eight Irish women who came to California in the 1950s. That's their voice. Listen to it. 
We go around in this country thinking that we invent ourselves. I did not invent myself. This voice you are hearing is the voice of everyone I've been in contact with in my life. Elvis Presley, Madonna, Fats Domino, Jack Kennedy, Pat Brown, Ronald Reagan, Ireland, Ireland. I remember about eight years ago, I went to Ireland for the first time. I was, um, I was living in London, a, a city that I love very much, but, but I will never be English. And there was, a, in the London Times, there was a little ad for a, a promotional tour to uh, Ireland. It was some very, very cheap uh, ticket to, uh, on Aer Lingus, the Irish airline, to uh, Dublin. And I thought, why not? Why not indeed? I got off the plane. You must promise me you'll not tell my mother if I tell you the story. <laughs> promise me this. Her number is 666. <laughs> I got off the plane that day on a Saturday. It was gray the way Ireland should always be. I got off the plane and I felt more at home that day in Dublin than I've ever felt in Lima or Mexico City or Guadalajara, which is where my mother comes from. And my mother says that Guadalajara is the most extraordinary city in the world. They have better ice cream there, she says, than any other city in the world. How is that possible? How should I feel at home in Ireland? How is that possible? You know, we live at a time in America where we're all walking around like this, you know. I'm Mexican and you're not. Or you're Chinese and I'm not. Or you're African-American and I'm not. Or you're Irish and I'm not. I am here to tell you that I'm Irish. The man standing in front of you is Irish. I remember some years ago I was being interviewed by Bill Moyers on public television. Moyers is sort of the conscience of public television. He had a role um, rivaled only by Julia Child. Moyers had a, a program called The World of Ideas, and somewhere, he, I think he's trained as a Baptist minister, and there's a very sweet manner about him, but he gets very worried when he's in the presence of a Mexican who says that he's Irish. And he doesn't know exactly what to, what to make of that, and he says, well, let me see if we can sort of straighten this out for our viewers, he said. Do you think of yourself as American, or do you think of yourself as Hispanic, he said. Interesting choice, that, don't you think? Hispanic or American? Which one are you? I said, Mr. Moyers, I'm Chinese. <laughs> I live in a Chinese city of San Francisco. I live, uh, I live next door to the Chinese. I eat their food. I'm becoming Chinese. Deal with it. <laughs> I was being introduced in the BBC about a year ago on the BBC World Service. Actually, the Scottish service uh, goes to Scotland and all these people milking their cows at the early morning in Aberdeen. And, and the woman said, Mr. Rodriguez, she said, Mr. Rodriguez is in favor of assimilation. And I thought to myself, I'm not in favor of assimilation any more than I'm in favor of the Pacific Ocean. I don't decide to become like you. I didn't wake up in the morning to decide that I was going to walk down the street like you do. In a few minutes, all of you, of all your nationalities, of all your religions, of all your ethnicities, you're all going to get up and walk out of this room and you're all going to walk out with the same American slouch. You all walk the same. And you're all going to wonder, what was this Mexican guy talking about being Irish? <laughs> we live at a time in America when no one is prepared to say that they're Irish or that they're Chinese unless they are. We live a few miles away from Tijuana, Mexico. And I'm over there all the time because I'm under the impression that Tijuana, Mexico is the second most important state of California, the most, second most important city in California after Los Angeles. I meet kids every day in Tijuana who are bilingual, bicultural, who know more about the United States of America than we have any idea about Mexico. And I think to myself, these kids listening to Janet Jackson with their Hard Rock Cafe t-shirts on, these kids are going to rule the world. 
And we sit here like this, holding on to what makes me black, what makes me Chinese. I keep telling people, you know, you go around this country and everybody's complaining about how Mexican we're becoming. I think we're becoming too Canadian. <laughs> Canada has this policy called multiculturalism and now it's part of every uh, high school and college in this country, multiculturalism. We keep drinking this Canadian water thinking it is so pure and there's this little virus in the Canadian water called multiculturalism. <laughs> Mexico doesn't know anything about multiculturalism. Mexico talks about mestizaje, which is something else. Every once in a while, Americans get tired of all this Canadian water and every once in a while, Mexican, uh, every once in a while, Americans decide that they want Mexican food, which everybody knows is bad for them. But we like the burrito. And we know we'll regret it in the morning. And we know it'll sit there all night. But we love Mexican food. Has anyone ever tasted Canadian food? I was, in, uh, I was at a California high school. It shall be nameless the other day. This is a true story. You can believe it or not. Lider, uh, writers are liars. <laughs> but I was in a California high school and we went to the cafeteria and there they were, the teenagers of California at the very moment of our internationalization, our very moment of Canadian multiculturalism, they had organized themselves as cafeteria tables. Over there were the surfers, over here were the Mexicans. They were not talking to the Mexican-Americans. Chicanos and Mexicans did not talk to each other. Over here were the, I don't know who they are, I think the nerds. Over here um, were the, um, who are those people? Uh, they have green and blue hair on. Over here were the African-Americans. Over here were the, um, who are those people? And somebody says, well, that's where the sluts sit. So I sat down with them. If you think I'm only talking about teenagers, I am also talking about a young Mexican-American man that I talked through Cornell Law School night after night, after week, after month, when he thought he could not go on. And he goes on and he graduates. Now he's working as a lawyer in Fresno. And you know what he calls me to say the other day? He's living in a gated community. And I feel to myself like a, like, a, like a parent who's lost their son. What have I done wrong? He's living in a gated community. At the other end of the cycle, I meet gang kids. I met these three kids in LA the other day who have a bad habit of shooting into crowds, shooting from moving cars, shooting at people who look just like them. What do you make of that? This kid lives within five blocks, five blocks. If he goes block number six, he's gonna get his head blown off because that's not ours. This kid talks about the family, man, my blood, man, these people, this guy, my, my family's behind me, man, they'll, they'll always watch me. His abuelita came up from Mexico 3,000 miles. His mother makes hotel beds in Santa Monica. She travels three buses to get there every day. He lives within five blocks. Minority. Because if we don't know how to walk block number six, because they're not doing that in block number six, or they're not wearing this color in block number six, then you are living in confinement. I've come here to a library to speak of libraries and I just want to say that at a moment in my life when I began to swim in English, I came to a place like this, not anything as glamorous as this building. Yet at a point in my life when I missed Spanish, when I missed the consolation of the tightness of that hold it had on me, I used to come to the library. I used to love this place because it was silent. I could be by myself. And you must realize that for many working class kids, this is the only place that sounds like this, where the television isn't on, or where mama's not talking on the phone, or where 
where, where, where the, the, the clatter of life is not surrounding you. You come here and it is quiet. That's the first luxury. The second luxury in Sacramento, California is it was air conditioned. I didn't have to sweat. And the third consolation were those shelves after shelf after shelf. There were books. And I was ambitious. I wanted what those books had. The nun said, there are certain books that if you read, you will learn what America is. And the book that they kept telling me about was Huck Finn. I could not make any sense out of Huck Finn. I didn't know what Huck Finn was saying. I didn't know what Jim was saying. I could not understand their, their conversation. I put it away. And besides which, I kept saying, thinking to myself, does, does the nun realize that the school marm is the villain in the book? My first book, and I found it accidentally, was by William Saroyan, who was an Armenian American in Fresno, California, a town that seemed in the 1950s and 60s to look very much like Sacramento. And Saroyan had this long, drooping, sad Armenian mustache. He looked Mexican to me, which was good enough. <laughs> and I read the human tragedy, the human comedy. And I remember thinking when I read that book, how extraordinary it is that I'm, I'm, en I'm enjoying this book by this man who's talking about being Armenian. How is that possible? How does a Mexican kid relate to an Armenian? And what does that mean? Am I an Ar Armenian? Is there something in me that is him and vice versa? And the rule of this room was always silence. But there was always that conversation going on, one book after another, these writers talking about other writers. And there was at the back of every book that you got these stamps, this record of other people who had made their way through the book. There is nothing like a library book, nothing that Borders sells or Barnes and Noble is ever like a library book. Library books are used. You can feel other hands on the pages. They smell differently. Sometimes they smell disgusting. <laughs> there are these strange stains on the side of the pages. Other lives have walked through these pages. You are not alone when you are reading this book. I can remember the texture of certain books that I, 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 I read as a child. So strong was a sensory impression. I can remember the, the feel of, of Willa Cather, literally the feel of the page. I can feel my Antonia. And I am there on a train station somewhere in the Midwest in a blizzard. We have just come from Eastern Europe. My family are, is Eastern European. We are immigrants and we are new to America. And there I am with Willa Cather. And I am 12 years old. Five blocks. I remember reading Alfred Kazin's book very early. One summer, I can remember an entire summer through that book, A Walker in the City. Alfred Kazin grew up on, in, in Brooklyn, New York, in a uh, Jewish neighborhood. He is the son of immigrants who spoke Yiddish to him. And I remember feeling the summer heat as I came out of the library and feeling some connection to Brooklyn, New York. How was that possible? That's what those shelves are about. The connection between lives. Look at the way these jackets stand against one another. One of the things I've gotten interested in at a time in which more than Ameri uh, 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 a million Americans are in prison is, is why so many of these young men and women, young men particularly, are in prison. And I, write, I teach a writing class in prison. I talk to young thugs all the time. Sometimes they have hearts of angels, so they write like angels. There is this one guy I know, his name is Joe, he's a, he's a bank robber. Very interesting man, Joe. Brilliant, Mexican-American, and he loves Russian novels. And we, t we read Tolstoy together, and he writes me these long 18th century letters, 14 pages, in prison. And I say, Joe, why couldn't you ever do this when you were going to high school? Why were you robbing banks in San Diego? 
One day he robbed three banks. This city was encircled with highway patrol and he got through. Why couldn't you write this way? I don't know. That's what they always tell you when you come face to face with some question. Why did you murder her? Why did you point the gun at him? I don't know. But there he is walking block number six with Russian novels in his lap. We keep arguing in America about bilingual education, about bilingualism. We keep arguing about Spanish and English and I keep telling people we don't speak English in America. We really don't. This language I am speaking is not English. The British would be the first to tell you. We speak American. We speak that ungrammatical formulation. We speak American. By which I mean that there is no one in this room who does not speak black English. No one. There is no one in this room who does not speak German. There are hundreds of German words in, the, in, in this American vocabulary. There is no one in this room, I don't care whether you're fur or gin, bilingual education, there is no one in this room who does not speak Spanish by virtue of speaking American. Where are we right now? Chula Vista. There is no one in this room who does not speak Yiddish. Somebody called me a schmuck the other day. <laughs> I remember reading a book by James Baldwin. This was the late 1950s. The black civil rights movement was going on on my black and white television. And there was a young writer named James Baldwin. He wrote a book called Nobody Knows My Name. And I liked his picture on the back jacket. And he looked like a crocodile, these extraordinary eyes. And I read that book, which was about living, growing up in Harlem, my first African-American book. And I thought of myself sitting over there 30 years ago. Because a few days ago in Los Angeles, I don't know whether you noticed in the paper, there was this major disruption at a Los Angeles high school between so-called Hispanic students and so-called African-American students. The Hispanic students were complaining that the African-American students have a whole month for Black History Month. They get, for La Raza or for whatever it is called, they get one day. And there they were. I kept thinking of Imelda Marcos, you know, who collects all the shoes. She kept, she said something once that I was always struck by. She said, you know, the rich of the world, we know each other, we like each other very much. We vacation in each other's houses when we are in Zurich or in Mexico City. Our children go to the same schools. We love each, we go to each other's dinner parties in Paris. The rich of the world, we know each other immediately. The poor, she said, are each other's necks all the time. Well, there they were in Los Angeles in 1999 fighting about whether or not blacks should have a, a month and whether or not Hispanics should have a day. And I thought of that kid reading James Baldwin who looked like a crocodile. And I thought to myself, I am black. Black History Month is my month. This notion that we are segmented populations, that now we're going to talk about them and then we're going to talk about you, and then we're going to talk about her. You want to talk about the Irish in America in 1840, when the Irish first start coming here, you have to talk about Mexico. Because the reason that the American nativists didn't want the Irish here was because of Mexico. The thought was that if they came to this country, the Irish, war was brewing with Mexico, they, as fellow Catholics, would, would unite with the, Irish, with, with the Mexicans and fight against the Protestant state. Do you understand that we are implicated in each other's history, all throughout our history? That if I were at that high school in Los Angeles, I would teach those kids, African Americans and Hispanics, that they are probably related to each other by blood. That what we have to do is figure out a way of telling our stories so that you're part of it. So that we are involved in each other's tale. So that I have some way, some stake in what it means to be Armenian. 
Karl Marx, the old commie, said the most extraordinary thing about California that I've ever read, and it's the truest thing. Karl Marx said that the discovery of gold in California in the 1850s would be a more important event in the history of the world than the discovery of the Americas by Columbus. That when Columbus came to the New World, he was looking for a curry restaurant. He sees some Indians, they see him. Two races meet. But, uh, but Marx says, the old commie says, when gold is discovered in California, the entire world meets. Malays, Filipinos, Brits, Scots, Australians, Peruvians, Chileans, Chinese, and they are at each other's throat. They're fighting over whores in, in cantinas. They are, they are shooting each other over pieces of mud. But Marx says for the first time in history, the entire world meets. And here you are. And all we can come up with is Canadian multiculturalism. I don't belong to a neighborhood. I don't belong to just one side of town. I don't even belong to a city. I belong to a country. There is nothing about the history or literature of this country that does not pertain to me. This voice that I am sounding belongs as much to Martin Luther King Jr. as it does to Thomas Jefferson, to the emancipator as much as it does to the slave owner. The books prove it. The books are all about each other. The books are written in the shadow of one another. They stand, they uphold one another. Literally, they keep each other standing. And I know now, because we are getting middle-aged, and because we all want to look and sound like that dreadful man up in Redmond, Washington, who owns all the computers and owns all the money, I know we have to tart it up and we have to bring computers into this building because we want to get everybody on the information superhighway. But remember that term, information superhighway, and remember what we are only saying, that computers are about information. What books are about, what the books were in my life had to do with something much deeper, much more intimate, relational, personal, had to do with the soul. One person speaking to another out of the deepest part of the soul. Not information, not facts, not even chat rooms, and certainly not email. I was stupid. I was a smart kid, but I was stupid. I thought that lights like this were just somebody Turned them on, turned them off. I thought the buildings like this got built. I didn't realize that anybody had to pay the bill. I didn't realize that you paid the bill for the, bu the books that I read. I've come here tonight to say belatedly, thank you. Thank you for this library. Thank you for those books. Thank you for letting me take out 10 at a time. Extraordinary. Most countries of the world don't have places like this. Thank you. I didn't realize you existed. I was stupid. But if it's any consolation to you, I made use of this place. I became an Irish Armenian in this place. And at a time in California when that is exactly what I'm seeing, little girls who tell me that they are Guatemalan Koreans, at a time in this, in this state when I'm going to places like Merced, California, and the Mongs and the Mexicans are living side by side, in a city of about 75,000 people. And the Mongs and the Mexicans in the history of the world have never lived side by side anywhere. And there they are, going to Safeway together. And they don't much like each other. The Hmong grandmothers tell their grandsons to stay away from the Mexicans. And the Mexican grandmothers tell their, their Mexican uh, grandsons to stay away from the Mongs. The other day I was, I was talking to some Hmong teenagers who looked like Elvis Presley. And they were going on and on about all the reasons they hated Mexicans. 
And I was writing all of this down, and I thought to myself, something is not computing in my little brain. And you know what it was? They were speaking English with a Spanish accent. <laughs> the other day, there is this girl who comes up to me in this city at a time in this city when there was a convention of mixed race children. When I'm spending the day, my, this kind of mind-numbing day, listening to children who say, my mother's white, my father's black, but I'm white or I'm black. Can't be both. All day it went on. And at the very end of the day, I met this wonderful young woman who said to me, my father's Mexican, my, father's, my mother's African. And I said, what are you? She said, I'm a Blacksican. <laughs> she made the word up because we don't give her a word to describe what it is to be of this room, to be of this library. We don't give her a room. Libraries are for Blacksicans. Thank you very much. If uh, you have questions, uh, you should pass them or hold them high. We'll collect them. Did anyone write out a question? You still have time. Let me ask you, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, um, who among the writers in English literature or American literature that you admire the most? or has influenced you the most? Um, the Mexican writer who's influenced me the most is Octavio Paz. Uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful poet and a, a splendid essayist. There, I, I've just been writing this, this essay about Canada and Mexico because I'm very much interested in NAFTA right now. As not as an economic idea, but as a philosophical idea. In what sense are we North Americans? In what sense are we related to Canada? In what sense are we related to Mexico? And what does it mean? You know, Mexicans don't know much about Canada and vice versa. I go, go to Mexico and I, I ask them about Canada and they said, you know, where all the blonde people sit in the snow, they said. And you, you, go, to Mex you go to Canada and, I, and, and people talk about a beach. You know, have you, they think of Mexico as a beach, you know, some place to get brown. But Octavio Paz was a true North American um, in the sense that he really had an imagination. And in a way you can only have this in a country that knows that it's not the most powerful in the world. He was interested in, in uh, Buddhism, had spent much of his life uh, in and, can, and, and interested in uh, India, and um, wrote also about France, as all Mexican intellectuals, they're all obsessed with France. They all marry French. Um, they live with her. They, 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 she is their lover forever. But he also spent much time in the United States Octavio Paz really was global in his thinking. And I'm trying to find a way to be an American writer equally global. The trouble with most American writers is that they are only interested, if they're interested outside of their, their own border, with Europe. And we lose many, many writers in Europe. Very few writers interested in Latin America, very few ever go to Africa. James Baldwin, for example, my, who, who is one of, in my opinion, one of the great essayists of the century, James Baldwin spends the, black, the years of the black civil rights movement in France writing movie reviews. And I think to myself, you know, um, the other intellectual whom I admire very much is not exactly a writer, but is a professor of literature, and Marsha McLuhan, who uh, McLuhan, I think, will be one of the great geniuses of, of the century. Because McLuhan understood Madonna before Madonna understood Madonna. Um, he understood why this presidential uh, impeachment hearing happened and didn't happen. He understands how television is changing our lives. He understands why people are interested in what Cheryl Teagues has to say about a presidential campaign, for example. Here he is, this great little professor of rhetoric in, in Toronto. But one of the reasons he understands as much about America is that he has to sit next to America. There is a, it's like sitting next to a teenager, you know, with a boombox on full blast, and there he is, you know. Um, and McLuhan is sitting there, this little gray man, 
And he has to listen to this the way all Canadians have to listen to our music. And he's trying to make sense of us. And I think that he could not have happened at UCLA. He could not have happened at NYU. He belongs to Toronto. He belongs to a North American perspective. I'm trying to write about North America now in that sort of way. I'm trying to write right now about the complexity of the United States, but not exactly from within the United States, from my Canadian and my Mexican points of view. I sometimes watch Telemundo. When I watch Telemundo, I see persons speaking Spanish who are blonde and blue-eyed and fair of skin. We have this stereotype, but the reality of Mexico is different than the stereotype that we North Americanos have. And for me, Telemundo helps me to understand that this perception or the stereotypical Mexican that I have isn't the reality. But Telemundo and Univision are also in the illusion business. And part of the illusion is that Latin America is blonde and blue-eyed. You turn on Mexican television, or turn on Venezuelan television, or turn on um, uh, television in Bolivia, and you would swear that you were in Sweden. <laughs> everyone, everyone is blonde and blue-eyed. And, um, and it's like, you know, it's, <laughs> there's, I go to these villages in, in, um, in the Andes, and there are all these Indians staring very calmly at these Venezuelan uh, telenovelas you know, just assuming that this is sort of the way the world works uh, beyond the, the, the horizon. I, I, have, I have said on Mexican television, on this dreadful news show on um, public television in Mexico, I predicted that brown is beautiful, will happen on the northern side of the border before it happens on the southern side of the border. I think you will see brown movie stars in the United States of America largely under the advances of the black civil rights movement, you will see blonde beauty and not Antonio Banderas, who's the Spaniard who one size fits all, you know, that once, one, one day he's a Cuban, next day he's an Argentine, next day he's a Mexican. You're actually going to see men and women on television look like Indians on American television soap operas before you will ever see it in Latin America. Because Latin America now is in such denial and, and, and in such... Um, what well, Paz would say in the midst of such self-hatred about its own reflection in the mirror that it cannot deal with, with its reality. But your general point is true. Most Americans think that everybody in Latin America has, is like this. We have little fingers and we're all brown and so forth. The problem is when Richard Nixon invented us in 1973, Richard Nixon came up with the, the idea that we were Hispanics. But I can introduce you to lots of different people who are Hispanic in the United States, or in Latin America for that matter. Nazis hiding in Argentina, Japanese running companies, uh, countries in, in, um, in Latin America, uh, Africans in, uh, like Sammy Sosa who consider themselves Hispanic and they're African. It's not clear that, that Hispanic has anything to do with a racial description. The other day I was at Yale University being trailed around by this very tiresome Latina who kept on telling me, uh, for some reason she wanted to tell me all the honors she has achieved in her career. She's a white Cuban and uh, there's nothing wrong with being a white Cuban. Ricky Ricardo was a white Cuban and we like Ricky and all that. But she kept chasing after me, telling me that she was the first Latina to do this, the first Latina to do that. And I thought, oh God, how am I going to get rid of this dame? You know, what am I, what's wrong with her? Or more to the point, what's, what's wrong with me? Why am I not more interested in her career? Anyway, I invited her to have a cup of coffee, sit down, chill, you know. And she said, in the middle of the conversation, she said, we people of color, she said. And I think to myself, you know, I fly around a lot, and maybe I'm losing my eyesight, but she's white. There are a lot of white Hispanics who are going around this country talking about we people of color. Because now we have begun to think of ourselves as a racial group. When I hear it said that, uh, that Hispanics are going to outnumber African Americans by the year 2004, whatever it is, I think to myself, how can you say that? What are you saying? 
You are saying something that is nonsensical. You are saying to me that a racial group is going to be outnumbered by an ethnic group. I know lots of African Americans who describe themselves as Hispanics. I know lots of white Americans who identify themselves as Hispanics. The only thing interesting about that is that they are identifying themselves ethnically in a country that has always and traditionally defined themselves racially. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that if it is true, what demographers tell us, that by the year 2040, one in three Americans will be Hispanic, if that is true, all that means is that by the year 2040, one in three Americans is going to identify themselves ethnically rather than racially. Now that may be important, or it may not be. Time for a couple more. But do you feel that bilingual education can be helpful for children? I, my, my feeling is that, um, that children should be bilingual, trilingual. My nephew, my glamorous nephew, who looks like uh, Keanu Reeves, is 13 years old and he speaks Mandarin. His favorite subject is Latin. Speak Spanish. Um, do I like that? Yes. My nephew, who looks like Keanu Reeves, goes to a very fancy prep school in San Francisco. His father is a judge. My very fancy uh, 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 nephew in San Francisco understands one thing about language that poor children do not understand as easily. Why is it, I keep asking friends of mine of the political left, why is it that you cannot understand the significance of social class in the way we talk about all of these issues? Social class has a great deal to do with language. One of the things children of poverty need to know how to do very early, it was certainly true with me, was to speak language publicly. This is as true for the kid in Bedford-Stuyvesant as it is for the Appalachian white kid in, in West Virginia. They do not know how to speak language publicly. For poor kids, the great bilingual debate is between public language and private language. I have a friend, African American. She went to a very fancy girls' school, women's college in upstate New York in the 1950s when she was the only black student in the school. She went home every summer. She remembers going home one summer her mother standing in the screen door in North Carolina, her mother opening the screen door when she was coming up the five steps of the, of the front porch, her mother saying to her as, as she came right into her mother's shadow, I don't want you speaking white in here. That's bilingualism. That's the bilingualism that matters to me. You think I worry about whether or not we can speak the language of Madrid or Barcelona? You think that's crucial to my identity? My ancestors didn't speak Spanish. They began to speak Spanish. Now we begin to speak English or American. But for the children of poverty that keeps them away from this microphone, it is that they never learn how to use language publicly. And our public schools are failing them generation after generation. We used to know what it meant to go to grammar school. We used to know what that term meant. I'm going to grammar school. We used to know what the term public school meant, that you would go to school to become a public person. Now you go to school. I was at, at uh, Berkeley the other day, and I was doing some film work for Canadian television. I was with my producer, and some Latinas saw me. They ran off to the dormitory and got some others, and they came over. There was pretty soon a group of about 30 or 40 kids around me. Wonderful kids, very sweet kids. But this girl said to me, this one, she said, you know, Mr. Rodriguez, she said, unlike you, she said, I'm not going to lose my culture in coming to Berkeley. She said, I'm going to, you come back in four years, she said, test me on this. Come back in four years. I'm going to use my education here to become closer to my culture. Then she went away. Maybe I'll see her another three years. My producer, who was standing next to me, said, that's the most extraordinary thing I've ever heard, he said. He said, you know, he's not Hispanic. He's far from it. He 
said, you know, we used to go to college, he speaks of his generation, in order to become cosmopolitan. We wanted to know the world. We wanted to know what people all over the world were thinking. We wanted to read French philosophers and Japanese uh, history. Now you go to college in order to learn more about your neighborhood. You go to college in order to say you can come out of college. At the graduation ceremony, they should all walk down the street. Instead of with their diplomas in their hand, they should all go like this, you know, like good Canadians. The reason I keep saying Canada, Canada has this policy, which is official government policy. It is complete ludicrousness. Uh, it's called multiculturalism, and the policy is that we will honor your culture. You never have to be, you never have to st stop being a Serb. You never have to stop being a Mexican. I'm a Mexican Canadian. He's a Serbian Canadian. He's a Croatian Canadian. He's a Greek Canadian. And we will honor that fact about you, your separateness, your diversity. Well, what if we are not diverse? What if I feel myself becoming like you? What does that mean? What if I find myself weeping, reading your story? What if I find myself walking like you do? What if I find myself singing your songs? Canada has no way of talking about that. The, the, the favorite uh, uh, metaphor for Canadian society is the mosaic, where all these sort of stone colored images, you know, I mean, uh, I'm red, you're green, you know, together we create the great mosaic of Canada, but I don't have to melt into you, you don't have to touch your, keep your elbows away from each other, keep like this. Like good Canadians, you just sort of walk down the street like this, you know. I had a wonderful line, I was speaking to the Canadian Library Association in Edmonton a few years ago, I had a wonderful line which nobody laughed at. I said that Canada had always struck me as the largest country in the world that doesn't exist. Camus wrote, I should like to be able to love my country and still love justice. Is that possible? Where does, where does this man get these questions? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea whether that's possible. I do find I do find the extraordinary exhilaration of this country to be, I mean, this, this country is such a calamity. We, are, we, st we stand here right now on this ground, and we are, what are 80 people in this room, we are the beneficiaries of so many accidents of history that bring us here. Think about a few of them in your own life, and think about them in, in, in terms of the Americas the accidents of history that have created our chairs, this moment, this microphone, our leisure. It is not justice that has brought us here, it's accident. But it is also justice that has brought us here. You think of someone like Thomas Jefferson and what we are beginning to suspect about Thomas Jefferson and that extraordinary relationship he has with Sally in the, in the woodpile, who is his wife's half-sister and you begin to realize what an incredibly complicated country this is and how much darkness there is, moral darkness there is in this country. And how close we are to some real violence in this country. But this little idea that this wigged slave owner starts giving us ends up in the hands of feminists, ends up in the hands of black liberationists, ends up in the hands of Hungarian uh, miners in Colorado, ends up in the hands of Serbians in California, ends up in the hands of Mexicans at the Border Patrol Station in Chula Vista who know that they have a right to this or that. That in the midst of all of that tragedy, there is this extraordinary survival of ideal in the country that this country still stands and that there is some generosity for the notion of liberty, equality, that you honor me as an American in a way that very few countries honor me. You wonder why it is possible for me in this country to come on national television with my, small, with my Indian face 
with this improbable voice to say on American television, I am gay. It is possible because of Thomas Jefferson. It is possible because of something that goes into the American stream that allows me to connect to this I, this extraordinary ability of Americans to stand here to say I. I am. I think. I want. I believe. The weakness we have as a society, if that is our strength, is that we don't know how to say we. We don't know how to say nosotros. We never understand that the reason I got my eye was because you gave it to me, or because I saw you taking it, and I learned it from you, and that we stand in some relationship to each other. We all think that we've come upon this American experiment by ourselves. I, inter I meet kids all the time who sort of think they've invented sex. Graham's had nothing to do with it. Every generation is new in America. There was this dreadful woman I met at Columbia University in the 1960s. During the Vietnam War, she said, I remember she said to me, America, she said, will never again be the pure and good country that I once thought it to be. And I thought to myself, it's, did she miss the chapter on slavery in the, in the history book? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what book was she reading? The good and pure country. Every generation in America has to lose their innocence because we have to think that we are, we've invented this country. So every generation loses its innocence. The Vietnam War is lost of innocence. The Civil War is lost of innocence. There was a tiresome Robert Redford movie called Quiz Show. I saw it, the, the promo some years ago. It's about some scandal in the 1950s having to do with quiz shows. And then the announcer says portentously, it was that time when Americans lost their innocence. And I thought, well, there it goes again. If we understood the power of the eye, we would understand that it passes through the we. Listening to you, sir, I'm reminded of what George Bernard Shaw said. That some men see things as they are and ask why. But I dream dreams that never were and ask why not. And my sense is, that's the question you cause us to ask. This has been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you.